Hey there, everyone, and welcome to episode 46 of the Halfway Through the Heat Wrestling Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Joe, and I'm joined today with my co-host, Tom. Tom, how you doing? I'm doing great. Good to hear. Re- Ready for another exciting uh, episode about wrestling? Uh, it could be about wrestling. Might be about wrestling. It's about. I think we, we we detoured a little bit in our last one. We're going to stay more wrestling focused on. We're going to stay a, a bit more wrestling focused. We've got some news to talk about. We've got uh, Money in the Bank to talk about. There was um, some predictable things that happened at Money in the Bank, and some not so predictable things that happened at Money in the Bank. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what cultures lists of best songs about wrestling. Um, yeah, it's it's not a list full of good songs. <laughs> no, it's a list with which I vehemently disagree. Um, yeah, it's it's not exactly a it's not a, exactly a sparkling list of hits you want to hear or make a mixtape out of. Um, but then we're also going to talk about some other random stuff, some upcoming shows, you know, that stuff we always talk about. And then, but before we get into all of the. Uh, actual content of the show we're going to say something positive about raw so tom what do you got to say positive about raw uh i liked um i liked the Sami Zayn uh kevin owens match i thought the commentary was weird because they at first they were implying like this was the blow off to their entire like lifetime of feuding and i thought well that seems odd and then they kind of backed away from that and they i don't know the commentary threw me off but it was a fine match and another uh, another chapter in the long book about these two uh, and their ongoing feud. Yeah, the, the match was really short, though. It was, but you know, uh, I liked it. I enjoyed it. What about uh, what about you? What did you? What was so positive about Raw for you? Um, of course, the return of John Laurinaitis. No, that wasn't. That, oh my god, that wasn't. Uh, that wasn't very positive. Um. I I guess the Wyatt family coming back. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. Uh, that, I, I I'm excited. To, there are a lot of people came back actually. I mean, Sasha Banks came back too. No, that's true. There were some returns that were that were nice. I thought the uh, the way they're furthering the um, John Cena AJ Styles feud is pretty good, which is basically aside from Owens Zayn is like the only feud I care about in the WWE right now. Yeah, that's true. I mean. There's not really any big time feuds going on. They, that's basically it. Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, and Cena and Styles. Cena and Styles was good though. That we did get a uh, horrifying uh, beat down on Cena again, which I like. I like that they're building it up so that it's not just Cena like squashing him from the start. I like it, it. Only makes sense. It, it can only be a good feud if you believe there's something hard to overcome. Yeah, I mean that's true. Then uh, they just had a uh, Cena beat up uh, Anderson for a little bit, and then uh, <laughs> then it just got beat down by everyone. That's true. Um, but uh, so I mean it was all right. The, we should jump right into the big news. Raw really was overshadowed uh, for me. I just added a news thing to our outline, by the way. Um, the big news happened today. Uh, I don't know when you're listening to this, so it happened Tuesday. Um, Roman Reigns, he's not uh, the good guy. He's not the bad guy. He's the guy. He's now the suspended guy. He <laughs> was uh, suspended for 30 days for violation of the wellness policy. Um, effective immediately. Uh, this is his first violation of the policy. I was looking at uh, ESPN about this. However, Roman himself tweeted about it. Uh, he said, I apologize to my family, friends, and fans for my mistake in violating WWE's wellness policies. No excuses. I own it. We don't actually know what the violation was. It's drugs, but we don't know if it was performance-enhancing drugs, recreational drugs, what. Um, the company is being tight-lipped about it. Uh in April, of course, there were two wellness policy-related suspensions. Uh, Adam Rose and Connor of the Ascension, 
Adam Rose has since left the company. Connor, I believe, is still on the roster. Um, but this was pretty uh, surprising news. Uh, and what we've learned since the news broke this afternoon is that WWE knew about it prior to the Money in the Bank pay-per-view, at which, of course, Roman Reigns, Roman Reigns lost his title to Seth Rollins, who then immediately lost it to Dean Ambrose. Um, and now there's, uh, uh, between now and Battleground, the next pay-per-view, there are 33 days. So for those of you who are counting at home, that means Roman Reigns will be eligible to compete in the Battleground pay-per-view. He's expected to be in a main event there. Triple threat against his old shield mates, Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins. What was your reaction when you heard that uh, Roman Reigns was suspended? Were you surprised? Yeah, I was pretty surprised. That's uh, me too. <laughs> that's big news. That's actually like a, a pretty uh, big story to to come out. Roman Reigns suspended. Well, I mean, it does make sense as to why he lost at the pay per view. Yeah, I was legitimately surprised that he lost at the pay per view. And uh, he lost clean to Seth, too. There was no skullduggery or anything. He just lost the match. And I thought, gosh, that's pretty. That's a weird decision. And then, of course, it comes out that he had violated the wellness policy. So not that big a surprise. Um, I wonder if, the, you know, obviously uh, we can all speculate, but I wonder if this is sort of uh, the end of the Roman Reigns mega push. God, I hope so. I do, too. I like Roman Reigns, but I, I think the mega push has killed him. Yeah, I I'm I think like he he doesn't he doesn't need the mega push making him like giving him the opposite effect. Like what he needs is to I mean it's not really going to work because he's only gone for 30 days and he's like just coming right back into a main event thing. But like Right. So I mean no one's going to care when he comes back. It's just going to there he's still going to come out to a round of booze. But um he, what they need to do is stop with the mega push for for Reigns and let him go back to getting over like he was. Like I mean, it, there's not. It's not like Roman Reigns has always been unpopular. I mean, he was really popular for a while, and then like they mega pushed him and uh, he, you know, everybody turned on him. But like, it, it it's not like. Uh, it'll go away. I don't think it's going to go away because I think they've been planning on the Roman Reigns mega push for years and years. Like if you remember in the CM Punk interview, CM Punk was like talking about how like, you know, when he's fighting the shield, he had to make Roman Reigns look strong. Right. So that was like when that took 20 to 13, 2014. Yeah. Yeah. 2014. Cause he left in, uh, 2015. Um, Although, I mean, I agree. I think they see him as the future, but I also think that, you know, Vince can change his mind on things and turn against people pretty quickly. Yeah, that's kind of true. Um, and there was a big jump in the ratings for Raw on uh, Monday night uh, with Dean as the champion. And although it seems inconceivable to me, like, if they maintain a healthy Monday Night Raw rating with Dean as the champion, I could see Vince say, like, all right, that's what we're doing. I could see that. Because the ratings have been bad, so he he Vince might actually be like, "Well, I didn't like want this Ambrose kid, but he's doing good. He's going for the brass ring. He's a millennial going for the brass ring. Is he a millennial? I don't know. He's a millennial. How old is he? Got to be a millennial. Uh, yeah, I guess he is. <laughs> I was gonna say he's not like he's not like thirty eight or something. So no, he's not. No, I think he's in his twenties still. He's a young guy, late twenties. Is he is he that uh, young? You know, there's there's one way to find out. Uh, there's probably a lot of ways to find out, but there's one way I'm going to find out. <laughs> You're going to call him and ask him. I'm going to call him and ask him. I'm going to call him Mox because that was his indie name, John Moxley. He's 30. He has just turned 30, so stinking millennial. Yes. Stinking millennial. He becomes the first um, uh, person to hold both the. WWE World's title and the Combat Zone Wrestling World title. I'm sorry. He's, I'm besides sorry. The Miz, right? Besides The Miz. He's the second <laughs> CZW champion. The Miz, who of course won Tournament of Death back in 2008 and then went on to win the WWE Championship. No, of course, uh, Dean Ambrose is the first. Um, but yeah, the Roman Reigns thing was generally surprising because he's been they've been pushing him as the face of the company and uh, to suspend him for a wellness policy violation... 
I mean, Randy Orton had wellness policy suspensions, so it's, it's not like Roman Reigns is the only high-profile guy to get one, but the timing was pretty shocking. Um, and uh, I don't know what the internal creative decision-making was, but it certainly looks like they took the belts off him at Money in the Bank because they were going to suspend him. Yeah, well, I mean, they already they already knew he had a violation, so they were probably just like, well, we got to suspend him, so got to take the belt off him. And because uh, because this is wrestling, there are a lot of people who are at first convinced this was a work, but in, in fact, it is real. He is he is suspended um, for a wellness bi- policy violation. It's hard to convince someone to admit publicly to drug use for a work. Yeah, uh, that's uh, especially when they have kids and stuff. So yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, you know, I could see wrestlers who would do it. Brian Pillman would have done it, but uh, probably not Roman Reigns. Um, so. Right now, that leaves uh, Dean Ambrose uh, in the catbird seat, right? It seems pretty unlikely that... Because after he won on Sunday night, a lot of people were saying, well, he's going to lose on Raw. You know, he's going to job to Reigns, and that did not happen, of course. Now we, we know why, or we at least know one of the reasons why. How long do you think Dean Ambrose can be the champion? Um, I don't know, uh, but he could be the champion for a while, I think. Like, it's not improbable it's it seems unlikely it does it 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 does seem weird i mean it honestly feels like they're doing this too late like if they had put the belt on him a year ago when he was it felt like he was really hot um that would have made more sense but what do i know i mean the rating went up and people were surprised and people were falling over themselves to talk about how happy they were i honestly think dean ambrose has seemed kind of neutered for the last i don't know eight months or so he just hasn't there hasn't been a whole lot of interesting stuff happening with Dean Ambrose. Yeah, I, I agree. He hasn't. Uh, he 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 has gone down in my rankings of people I like to see on TV over the past yeah. like you know year or so. He's not bad. He just seems kind of stale. Yeah. So well, you know, maybe this will uh, revitalize Dean Ambrose. It could, yeah, because he's you know he's the lunatic fringe and. Um... And he's, he already has a, a ready-made feud with Seth Rollins. And I loved, before Seth got hurt, I loved the uh, the juice in their feud. Like, Dean Ambrose would, like, crazily run out and try to stop Seth cashing in. Remember when Seth had the Money in the Bank briefcase and was trying to get the title? Like, Dean Ambrose would run out and foil his plans. And Dean Ambrose was like, I'm going to shadow you. I'm never going to leave you alone because he was so mad about the shield breaking up. Like, those two guys had real, I think, chemistry in their feud. And, I mean, I, I think that could be a, that could be a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, it could be good. I hope it's good. I mean, uh, it it would. I I wouldn't be sad to uh, start liking Dean Ambrose again. No, no, and I think Seth Rollins. I mean, like right now, everybody wants to cheer for Seth Rollins because he just came back from a major injury. But uh, they're obviously going to keep him heel. But I think that's an easier task when Dean Ambrose is the champion because people like Dean Ambrose, and so it's easier for them to you know root for Dean Ambrose and boo Seth Rollins. Yeah, I guess that's true. Whereas everyone was clearly cheering for Seth Rollins over Roman Reigns. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was really obvious at the pay-per-view. Yeah. No matter how much they tried to, you know, make the crowd noise less distinct, it was pretty clear what was happening. Yeah, it was, uh, it was like, man, there were, there was no, uh, Roman Reigns love at the pay-per-view. No. And it, again, it was a good match. It was like his umpteenth good match. Um, but people are just, you know, reading on Twitter, people are just pissing all over Reigns and his work. And, and I realize it's a battle that we're never going to win. I, I don't know. Like, again, you and I have been very critical of the way he's been pushed and the way they've handled him as a champion and all that. But we've said, you know, he has good wrestling matches, but I, and I feel like we're never going to convince people of that. It's the same thing with John Cena. Yeah. I mean, I think, but I think people are probably more open to accepting John Cena as having good matches because he's had so many. But it's true. And Roman Reigns is still like the kind of hate du jour, I guess. Like, yeah, he doesn't have as many. Yeah, you're right. So like, even though like he's had a good match against the Big Show, a legitimately good match, not a good for the Big Show match, a good match. Period. People are still like, oh, he has to be carried by his. The Big Show cannot carry anyone to a good match at this point. Yeah, that's. I mean, <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't think that goes without saying. But yeah, people are just not gonna. They just don't want to <clears throat> give Reigns any credit, which is dumb. 
Um, but there's more news. It's not just sad uh, news about Roman Reigns taking 30 days off. Uh, I believe that's an unpaid suspension, too. So that, that hits you in the old pocketbook. I could be wrong about that. Um, we now know. So the uh, uh, the brand split is going ahead. SmackDown, Raw. There's going to be a draft. So we know some details about the draft. The draft is going to be exciting, I think, because we're going to. The draft will happen. We're going to. Yes, I agree. We're going to get to see a bunch of people that we uh, aren't expecting. I think it's you know like the draft. I I have a feeling that the draft is going to be like the Royal Rumble, except like without the. Uh, well, maybe not without the old timers. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, we should talk about that. So the draft is going to be Tuesday, July nineteenth, um, on SmackDown, the first live SmackDown of the new era. And um, this is an exciting new era for WWE in which we will yet again reinvent ourselves by creating a second night of compelling live television, executive producer Kevin Dunn said in a statement. Oh, Kevin. So um, the, uh, we, we, uh, we don't know if NXT will be part of the draft. Um, we don't, there's a lot of unresolved questions about who will be eligible for this draft. Um, we don't know if there's going to be a separate title lineage for SmackDown. We don't know what the story is, but you had heard some rumors that uh, and at least some of these seem likely because um, uh, people have been talking on the record about them, about some old faces returning to the fold perhaps. Some old faces. And by old faces we mean old. Like old people. <laughs> no. So what, like, I, the one that seems most plausible to me because he has said he's coming back is Kurt Angle. Yes, uh, there were there were four big names that that people mentioned, and then like a bunch of not so big names um, that they also mentioned as possible possibly coming back. But uh, Kurt Angle was probably the biggest and most obvious one. Um, another was Jeff Hardy. Well, um, they should bring back Matt Hardy as well. For yeah, it'd be a surprise a, if Jeff came without Matt as broken Matt Hardy, of course. Yes, and his brother Nero. Like I just want to see them continue that feud wherever they go. They should do that forever. Who cares if it's taken directly from TNA TV? It's, it's good, good stuff. Uh, the other one was Rey Mysterio. And the last is Goldberg. I don't know how I feel about... Um, well, I know how I feel about Goldberg coming back. It's a big thumbs down. But <clears throat> Rey, Myster- yes. Rey Mysterio wouldn't be bad. But I think um, he can't come back, is my guess. Yeah, I don't know what his the specifics of his deal with Lucha Underground is, but I know he's in season three, and my guess, I haven't seen a contract or anything, but my guess is there's a no-compete clause which would keep him off television until season three airs. Yeah, I mean, because that's how it was when Hernandez was uh, got in trouble with TNA for like competing on TNA TV while right. l- before his episodes of Lucha Underground aired. So, I mean, because they had yeah. been taped months before but like uh his his episodes hadn't aired so he couldn't uh he couldn't appear on tna tv so i'm wondering if like ray mysterio has a similar kind of thing where he can't can't go to wwe and be on tv while before season three happens so i mean that also applies to at least one of the other people um in the in the not so uh, famous uh, people who might come back to WWE, and that would be John Morrison, also known as Johnny Mundo in Lucha Underground. He was mentioned as possibly coming back, along with Carlito and Crime Time. Crime Time, Tom. Crime, crime Time. I so I saw them in Rhode Island in November, and uh, they were saying very nice things about the WWE and they talked about how they'd like another chance at the WWE and I remember thinking, yeah, that that's not going to happen, guys. And may, I mean, maybe it will. Yeah, now uh now, now the return of crime time. Um but also some other names that were listed, Shelton Benjamin, MVP and Stevie Richards. Um Stevie Richards was just tweeting some passive aggressive stuff about his WWE royalties, so I'm not really sure how plausible that is. But uh, of all those names, the two that make the most sense to me are Johnny Mundo and uh, Shelton Benjamin. Yeah, well, Shelton Benjamin, I could see coming back. He's been in, um, uh, I guess, Noah here, but like he's part of uh, Suzuki Goon, which is like 
with Minoru Suzuki, the most terrifying old man in wrestling. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and like he's still good. Mundo's still good. They're both relatively young, and I think John Morrison slash Johnny Mundo, he's become a star relatively in Lucha Underground. I think he's he's shown, you know, sides of his his abilities and his talents that he didn't get a chance to show in WWE. So I could definitely see why they'd be interested in bringing him back. But again, as you said, there's the question about the contract. I mean, I I assume he's in season three, and uh, if he has that non compete thing, then he's it, it would not be until the fall of 2017. Yeah, I mean, same for, same for Rey Mysterio. That's yeah. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of waiting. It is a lot of waiting. Um, but I guess the the broader question is, well, first of all, like I think Goldberg makes no sense. Goldberg has not wrestled in many many years. Was not a really good wrestler when he did wrestle. He's a big name, but what can he do? Um, he can he can come out and have like a single match, like Sting. Yeah, right, and then get hurt and then disappear. Yeah, that's pretty much what will happen, I'd guess, with uh, Goldberg if he were to come back. Um, some of the other people kind of make sense. Like, MVP kind of makes sense, like, because he got fired by from TNA or whatever he was. Maybe he was working on Lucha Underground, and he got fired for uh, some kind of, like, uh, error where he, like, mentioned things that were happening in the story before they happened on a podcast. Oh, right, right. But yeah, M- MVP still has a following. Like Kurt Angle, in some ways, makes sense. He's one of the big names from the Attitude Era. I just don't know. You know, he's he's old and he's beaten up and he's had a lot of serious injuries, and I don't know how much there's left in the tank for Kurt Angle. I'd like to see Kurt Angle back as long as he doesn't die on TV. I'd like to see him come back as in a, like a, a mostly non wrestling role, like a commissioner or something. Yeah, that would be fine. Um, I was I was hoping that since they were bringing back former authority figures to uh, to be, you know, like show up like they brought back John Laurinaitis and uh, Teddy Long and stuff. Right. I, right. I was hoping that this it was the inevitable return of the Hulkster. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. I still I still think SummerSlam, but uh, we haven't we haven't really heard much talk about the Hulkster. I would uh, I would like to see him come back. He he's not one of the rumored people to come back though. Um, but Stevie Richards, Blue World Order, coming back. Blue Meanie, get him back. Hard to imagine uh, uh, Stevie Richards coming back. Although maybe, I don't know. No, I guess I like um, Stevie Richards showed up somewhere recently, TNA, and he looked really good. <laughs> yeah, he looks he looks good, but he like, like yesterday, he just tweeted a, a, him holding a can of cat food and he's like, thanks for my royalty check, WWE, I guess. And he named his cats. You know, I guess Frisky and Felix will get to upgrade this quarter or something like that. <laughs> so, which was funny, but, like, it's not the kind of thing that, you know, I imagine they see in Stanford and say, like, oh, great, that's awesome. We want that guy. They want that guy, to Stevie Richards. And let's be honest, they can have their pick of wrestlers. It's true. Um, but I think the, you know, the, the draft is going to be interesting because... Uh, I, I think we will get to see a bunch of people get called up from NXT, like surprisingly or not surprisingly, and we'll also get to see some people we didn't expect to see at all. Maybe Kurt Angle, maybe some other people. Um, yep. And I think, you know, it'll be interesting. It'll, it, uh, the draft will actually be happening uh, just before just before we record the show. That's right. We'll be able to respond to the draft in real time, folks. Real time. Yeah, that's uh, it's rare for this podcast, but now that there's a live show that happened that like will basically finish at, uh, I well, I guess like during when our, when we're recording. What do you mean now that there's a show? What about Impact? It's not live. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, I could have looked at the Impact results like two weeks ago. How dare you? This is actual violence. Um. Yes. No. So the draft will be exciting, and I, I do hope that that some NXT people get called up. It's time for Bailey and time for Finn Balor to go somewhere else. Um, and then I hope that frees up some TV time on NXT for some of the folks who have not been on TV. Um. But yeah, the draft will be exciting. I, I'm looking forward to it. I really do hope we see some some surprise names, perhaps some cruiserweight 
classic names. Who knows? That would be nice. Kota Ibushi comes out on SmackDown. That would be amazing. Yeah, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. But, you know, something like Drew Gulak, that is plausible. Yeah, well, I mean, it could happen, but I doubt it'll happen before the uh, Cruiserweight Classic is finished. No, that's probably true. That, That would be hard to see. But you know what? 2016 is such a weird wrestling year. I'm not going to bet against anything. It's true. It's been a weird. It's been a weird wrestling year. Um. So, uh, for other news, uh, sort of lawyers, guns, and money news. You know this by now. Jerry Lawler was arrested in Memphis for uh, charged with uh, it's kind of a domestic violence. Uh, also arrested was his um, his uh, girlfriend. Uh, 27-year-old Lauren McBride, who herself was charged with domestic violence. Um, doesn't seem like anyone was seriously hurt. Uh, a judge has ordered both of them to stay away from each other. Um, you know, it is what it is. I uh, posted on, on the blog a, an old uh, clip of Jackie Fargo, who was Jerry Lawler's Memphis, or his mentor in the Memphis Territory. Jackie Fargo was arrested for hitting his wife, although the charges were later dropped. Um, but, uh, you know, so Lawler is suspended from WWE. Um, he still has taking indie dates and so forth. But uh, uh, what do you think this means for Raw? Do you think this means uh, Corey Graves, he of the fedora hat oh. or Trilby, whatever it is? Jeez. He, he looked like he, he looked like a, I, I don't even know, like a hipster version of a My Little Pony fan. <laughs> yeah he looked like if one of those uh, like a brony guy like just hit the gym constantly and got a bunch of tattoos yeah milady <laughs> was what what was he thinking he was probably thinking about twilight sparkle or whatever the uh, <laughs> his favorite my little pony was if they give him a gimmick as a brony like an angry brony i i will get a cory graves t-shirt um well i don't I, I guess he might be a show up on SmackDown, right? Oh, that's true, because they've got a... I mean, well, Moro Ronaldo. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. But, I mean, Lawler's out of the picture uh, for foreseeable future. I believe that was an indefinite suspension. Indefinite, which yeah. usually, Which usually means uh, he'll be suspended until um, Vince thinks people have forgotten about it. So, three or four months. Yeah, probably we won't be hearing from Jerry Lawler until maybe it's time for Survivor Series. That would be my guess. Yeah. Um, you know, again, like this is a, obviously a, uh, unpleasant thing, but it's not, you know, nobody got seriously hurt in this, uh, you know, obviously don't hit women, but, um, <laughs> well, Jerry Lawler claims he didn't hit any, any, women, exactly. So. Yeah. You know, he claims it's like a pushing and shoving kind of thing. And, you know, it's honestly good. A lot of States, I don't know if Tennessee is one of them, but a lot of States have laws now where there's, if there's any call, uh, for domestic violence, they have to arrest at least one person. Which is actually a really good law, because in the past there'd be a domestic violence call, the police would show up, and the victim, typically a woman, would say, would say, no, no, it's okay, it's okay, you know, and the police would leave, and then then the violence would get worse, including people would get killed. So it's good now the police just arrest someone. In this case, arrested two people. Um, but uh, I, I, this is one of those stories that um, friends of mine who don't like wrestling or don't pay attention to wrestling it, it like it was on espn or something so they noticed it so i got a lot of like text messages and tweets from friends like hey what's going on what's going on <clears throat> and the, like they couldn't believe and this is so such a perver- like everyone in wrestling everyone who knows anything about wrestling knows that jerry lawler likes to date much younger women yes he does this is this has even been like a joke on um when i first got back into uh, watching raw like three plus years three years ago like AJ Lee made some kind of joke to Jerry when he like he was he said something you know uh, on camera he said something like oh AJ Lee dismissive of her and she said something like am I too old for you because she was like twenty five <laughs> and I uh, I was like oh good I'm glad I'm watching Raw again I'm glad that hasn't changed um, but everyone knows it however people who don't follow wrestling were like shocked and horrified uh, a friend of mine was like. God, he could be her father. And uh, in reality, he'd be kind of old to be her father because Jay Lawler is 66. In fairness, a well-preserved 
uh, very fit 66, but 66 nonetheless. And uh, the, this woman who uh, he was living with is 27. We can only hope to uh, walk in Jerry Lawler's shoes. Yeah, you know what? As long as they're happy. <laughs> that's all that matters. But uh, yeah, this was, a, this was a, another chance. This is one of those uh, wrestling stories that you wish your friends who don't like wrestling had not seen. That's also true. Because not only is it a domestic violence thing, but they're like, this guy's like 40 years older than her. And you're like, yeah, he likes him young. And honestly, <laughs> God forgive me. Honestly, when I saw she was 27, I was like, she's kind of old for him. Yeah, that's kind of true. 27. It's like, it's like six years past his normal dating range. I know, yeah. He's losing his mojo. Um, all right, enough uh, enough Jerry Lawler. I think that's it for news. It's a pretty quiet news week. Am I missing anything? Uh, you're missing oh. Alberto Del Rio getting injured. Oh, yeah, no, I had two injury stories, actually. So Alberto Del Rio got hurt at uh, Money in the Bank. Referees threw up the X, as they say. And uh, we don't know the extent of his injuries, but uh, we hope he's okay. Get better soon, Alberto. And the other injury story came from the Indies. Some indie promotion in Florida over the weekend, Candice LeRae and Joey Ryan, the world's cutest tag team of wrestling. Uh, something happened. I saw a report saying it was a botched Hurricane Rana, but whatever the case, uh, Candice landed really badly, and uh, they had to stop the match. Um, and uh, she broke her nose, uh, chipped some teeth, and had a, a nasty, nasty cut in her lip. And um, But this... This goes to show you how, how tough Candice LeRae is. This is like a Harley Race-esque story. So she's hurt pretty bad, but she walks to the back by herself and stays to watch Johnny Gargano's match because they're engaged. And then she drives herself to the hospital in Florida. She goes to the emergency room and like she you know checks into the emergency room and then she's waiting for like four hours like with a lot of blood loss and a broken nose. And folks, if you've ever broken your nose, it is, it is painful. It's not like life-threatening. But it's excruciatingly painful. And uh, so, like, they're just not getting to her because, you know, emergency rooms. Basically, if you go to an emergency room and you say, I can't breathe, they see you right away. But if you can walk in by yourself and sign in by yourself, otherwise, they just tell you to take a seat and get to you when they get to you. So she leaves the emergency room. (laughs) She's like, fuck it. Leaves the emergency room. Ice is down her nose. She and Johnny Gargano fly back to Cleveland the next day. He takes her to the emergency room there. She gets a bunch of tests. They tell her it's a broken nose, just some chipped teeth. And uh, and then they watch Game 7 of the finals uh, together, and, and the Cavaliers win. That's a Harley Race-esque badass story. <laughs> you break your nose. You chip your teeth. You're bleeding everywhere. You go. You take yourself to the emergency room. They don't see you soon enough. You're like, fuck you. I'm leaving. You get on a plane the next day and then go to a different emergency room. <laughs> yep, that's... Uh... Although if it was Harley Race, he would have just uh, put a Band-Aid on it. That's true. If it was Sabu, he just would have glued it. Yeah, if it was Sabu, it would have just been a little bit of super glue. Day finished. He's right back out there. So, uh, get well soon, Alberto Del Rio and Candice LeRae. Candice LeRae is scheduled to be uh, in Providence uh, for the Women's Wrestling Revolution show on July 31st. I hope she's able to make it. Um like, a, a broken nose is not something that interferes, obviously, with, like, it's not like a, a knee injury or something, but you do want to take it easy, because you don't want to re-break that. True. Could be okay. Yeah. Could happen. I have though. not seen any, any, any word of cancellation yet, so I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, all right. So, we kind of talked about Money in the Bank, but I guess just real briefly, I wanted to get your thoughts on... Uh, in particular, what did you think of the Cena Styles match? Because this was like a real dream. This is one of the, I mean, the term dream match gets overused, but this really was one. Like these guys had never met before. Uh, and this is one that fans talked about the way that back in the 80s, people like us would have talked about Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan. That's, that's true. Um, this was a good match. I mean, this was it a was. really good match. Um, again, <laughs> people who, who don't think John Cena can wrestle. Watch this match. And I, I like the kind of match it was because it was not like a crazy high spot fest. It was, it was in a lot of ways a very old fashioned like 1980s style wrestling match where they built really slowly and uh, had a lot of reversals and um, 
it was cl- it was like clearly a match between two guys who've been doing this for a long time. It's it's uh, a kind of uh, a like a Ricky Steamboat Ric Flair kind of match. Yes, exactly. Like really well matched guys, and you could see that in the way they did it. There were a lot of reversals and a lot of things, like a lot of whips and things that would normally result in the guy going to the ropes. They would stop and they would. It, like it was clearly the guys who had scouted each other, guys who knew what they were doing, guys who weren't going to fall for. I mean, it was a good story in that sense. Without beating you over the head with it, you could just see from the way they interacted that these guys had like watched each other and sort of knew, even though they had never wrestled before, they had scouted each other out and and kind of knew what to expect. Um, I liked it. I thought it was really good. It it it, it wasn't uh, crazy. I think people's expectations have gotten to the point where like PWG and things where it's going to be like. 50 near falls and kicking out of finishers and a lot of crazy high spots. I like those matches, but I like this one too. It was a slower, quieter burn, but I think all the more effective for that. Yeah, it was, it was a really good match. Um, it did not disappoint in terms of like the pay, I guess like, uh, what I was expecting to happen. Um, that the rest of the pay-per-view, not, not incredibly hot, but no, <laughs> No, and honestly, uh, people were, were upset about the ending of Cena Styles. I thought it was perfect. In fact, I believe in the podcast, our last episode, you and I said this was the outcome we wanted. Yeah, that, that, that we said like this would be the be- a better outcome than uh, having Cena win. Yes. Which we thought what might happen because uh, Cena, Cena winning, coming back and losing without like uh, like losing clean would be dumb. But, you know, he didn't. He lost, but he lost exactly in the way we said he would if he were to lose. Yeah, and I mean, let's be honest. I know people complain about this, but they're not going to have Cena come back and lose clean. They're just not going to do it. Um, his first match since he's been back, they're just not going to have him like go out there and just lose in the center of the ring. And again, I think it goes... This is the whole Bullet Club thing, right? These guys look out for each other and they don't care about the rules, and, and uh, I think it, it worked perfectly. So now Cena is feuding with three guys instead of one. Yeah, it's great. I uh, and like I, I see a lot of people complaining about it too. Like, I don't know why you're complaining. The, AJ Styles is a heel, right? Exactly. <laughs> that's 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 exactly the finish he should be having. He should be like saying, "Oh no, I didn't want them to do that," while taking advantage of them doing that. That's what a heel exactly. does. That's that. It's classic. It's, it's like a classic heel formula. Yeah, it's Ric Flair and the Four Horsemen, like coming out to help Flair and him being like, "Oh no, I don't want those guys helping me out." But what you know, it's just there are pe- people who are like AJ should have won clean, and it's like, buddy, what don't you get about professional wrestling? Bad guys cheat even if they don't need to. That's why they're bad guys. Like there, there's too much of this, you know, two grapplers respecting each other shit. There should be a guy who's willing to break the rules because he doesn't care, and he's the bad guy. And there should be a guy who refuses to break the rules, even if it helps him out, he's the good guy. It's a simple story. It's a classic story that wrestling's been telling for literally over 100 years. Don't mess with the formula. Yep, and it works. And it worked in this match. And it worked the next night on Raw when he came out and was like, made them apologize. Yeah. And and then they, they went and did the uh, exact thing they were apologizing for, which is what bad guys do. Exactly. It's it's perfect. Um, it's a perfect setup. It's a perfect um, heel setup. Like it clearly makes AJ Styles the heel. And the crowd was really into it. The crowd was the crowd was kind of uh, subdued for most of Money in the Bank, but they were like they came to life for that match. They were super hot, as they should be. Well, you know they were subdued for Money in the Bank because the the matches for Money in the Bank were not so hot. I mean the pre show was different than uh, they had. We had uh, said though there was actually yep. ex- extra matches there, and it turns out like they wanted to add extra matches because they wanted to postpone the end of the show until after the basketball game was over, so they could get more tweets. That's interesting. I heard that. I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I got super distracted by the uh, end of the basketball game because it was so close and it was such a good game. Yeah. So uh, apparently they uh, they postponed the the end of the end of the show like the. Uh, the reigns uh the reigns rollins match until after the basketball game was done 
Interesting. That's interesting. No wonder that uh, Rusev Titus O'Neil thing took as long as it did. I was like, why are these guys killing time? They don't have any time to kill. Yeah, there was like, uh, and then they added those extra matches in the beginning. That we the Dudley Boys and uh, the what? What's it called? Uh, the Lucha Dragons. Yeah, that match wasn't mentioned before at all, and suddenly it was on TV. Yeah, and Baron Corbin and uh, uh, Zigzag Zuggler got bumped to the main show. Yeah, I mean, both of those matches that were supposed to be... Apollo Crews and Sheamus also was supposed to be on the pre-show, but it got bumped to the actual show. Um, what was the other pre-show match? I forgot. Um, there was just the one pre-show match. No, there were two, I swear. Wasn't there two? No, I think it was Dudley Boys and Lucha Dragons, and they went right into the show. And they just moved... There were originally going to be two, Corbin and Ziggler, but they moved that to the... Uh, the main show. I'm, uh, oh, I, I, okay. I guess I'll, uh, take your word for it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm actually, I'm not going to take your word for it. I'm going to look it, look it up because I'm, look it up. I'm almost I could positive. Be wrong. Pre-show. Oh yeah, there was the golden truth versus Brizongo. Oh man. That's not even a tape machines review. It's uh, Gold Dust and Our Truth fought uh, Tyler Breeze and Fandango, and <laughs> oh yeah, did you did you see this match? Because it was no, it was I like didn't. a goofy comedy match where um, Tyler Breeze and Fandango had really bad sunburn and they couldn't tag each other well. <laughs> oh boy! And there was lots of chopping. Well, it sounds like all the viewers were the winners. Whoever won the show, the match. Um, Golden Truth won. They finally won their match, Tom. Boy. That's the feud of the year. You know, like um you see, the thing with that is is like that story with Gold Dust and R Truth has been going on forever, and people actually kind of care about it. Like when they come out, they get they get like an actual reaction from the crowd. It's not like when um the Shining Stars came out and like the crowd was like dead silent and then like right. they disappeared yeah. forever. Um, yeah, no, pe- people do get a reaction. I'm not one of those people, but I, I do, uh, I do hear it. People do, uh, like those guys. Yeah. But like they had an actual s- story for those guys. It wasn't even like a, uh, it wasn't like they just came out and people suddenly started liking them. It's like they had an actual story that people got invested in and, you know, and they actually did a good thing with it because like they, you know, they were first like. You know, Goldust really wants to be Dark Truth's tag partner, and Our Truth doesn't want to tag. And then they like switched roles halfway through that, where like Our Truth really wants to tag, and Goldust isn't interested in it anymore. And, yeah. and then like they finally get together to tag, and they just get destroyed in their first match by Tyler Breeze and Fandango. They get beat, and then uh, then they decide like, oh, you know, they're all like despondent like maybe we shouldn't have done this this is a bad idea and then they decide like oh no we're gonna do it we're gonna go back and we're gonna beat these guys and then they actually came back and beat these guys it's actually a good story it's like a it's kind of like the underdog story it's like the bad news bears of wwe but like the you know the thing with it is is that like you know they didn't actually put it on the show so like it's the kind of it's it's the weirdest thing because like this this feud is dumb. It's a dumb feud, okay? It's like a comedy feud. But people cared about it because they gave them a story and gave them a reason to care about it. And, like, um, they didn't do anything with it, and they could have. But yep. um, it just kind of shows just kind of shows you that like when you give some people like a story to care about, they'll care about it. And, like, you know, if you want to get get people interested in your in your shitty matches or your stupid characters that nobody cares about baron corbin and Dolph ziggler for example you give them a story that people might actually care about and people will they'll start to care about it um because like i just just went on summarizing the uh the whole golden truth saga here and that was that was on the pre-show whereas baron corbin and Dolph ziggler have been feuding for like 150 years now and I still don't know why. I don't either. I think it's over. Corbin won. I think that's it. I hope that's it. Because, God, I didn't care about that at all. I can't remember the last time I cared about a Dolph Ziggler match. Yeah. Um, 
they, they kind of dropped the ball with him because he was they really did. he was really over too. Like people really liked yeah. Dolph Ziggler. Um, I man, I don't know why, but people do really like the guy, and like even though his gimmick is apparently that he's Billy Gunn, um, <laughs> I I really don't know how they could have dropped the ball with him as badly as they did. Because, like, he was someone, like, everyone was like, yeah, Dolph Ziggler, he's going to definitely be the champion. Yeah, he's got a good look. He's good on the mic. He's not bad in the ring. Um, and he, like, people were crazy for him. and But now he's like a heat magnet. Like, he just comes out and nobody cares anymore. Yeah, he is, uh, he is, he just... He, heat vacuum, I should have said, not a heat magnet. Yeah, I was going to say heat vacuum, huh? Heat vacuum. <laughs> Sex. Sorry, it's very hot where I am right now. So I've just got, uh, I've just got heat on the brain. Just he just sucks the heat out of the room. He is a, uh, he's an air conditioner. Um. But yeah, I mean, otherwise, eh, I like the uh, Cena Styles. I like the main event. I like the uh, title change. I like that Ambrose uh, cashed in the um, briefcase right away. Honestly, the Money in the Bank match itself, there were some, you know, it's exactly what we said it was going to be. There were some good, crazy spots in it, but it was the exact same Money in the Bank match we've seen a dozen times. Yeah, that was the most predictable match because, like, um, if you go back to last episode, you'll see that we predicted exactly what would happen in that match. Yes. Like, exactly to the winner. And then the main event happened, and then there was the automatic cash in from. Dean Ambrose, which is also something that uh, I believe you predicted on the last show. No, see, so, so we predicted it, but sadly we were we predicted it Friday night when we were watching the Shine. Oh, interview. that's right. We didn't talk about it on the show. So it wasn't recorded, but trust me when I say we were like, because that's exactly what happened on Shine. Well, not quite. So Eva Lee, there was, they had a Money in the Bank match for like number one contender match on Shine. Eva Lee won, and then she cashed it in and won the title. And we were like, that's going to happen. That they're going to do that at Money in the Bank. Uh, the only difference was that Ambrose cashed in after the match, whereas Ivelisse, who's a better sportsman, cashed in at the beginning of the match. To make a three-way match a four-way match. Right. Which is... So she wasn't taking advantage of someone who had just had a wrestling match. She was competing on equal basis. But uh, Ambrose, clearly not the sportsman that Ivelisse is. Uh, but it, we were like, the, this Money in the Bank thing is done. It's a one-night gimmick. They're just going to do it. And, and we were right. Sadly... Uh, oh, nobody heard us. That sucks. I, I could have sworn we said it on the show, but actually we didn't. Damn. No. Damn. We would have got the uh, got the perfect prediction on that. I do like the idea though that um, WWE creative is like watching Shine, and they're like, we should do that. <laughs> yeah. No. The uh, the Shine pay per view was all right. Um, it was good. Yeah. I mean, like they can be pretty hit or miss, but uh, this one uh, had some really good matches on it. That is that is true. That. Yeah. The uh, um, although even their money in the bank uh, result was predictable because basically <laughs> at the beginning of the show you're like well why would they put all the best people that they have right in the first match of the show and they're like because someone's gonna cash in later just like yep. dope <laughs> yeah so we that that kind of happened but uh, you know it's it's the money in the bank thing it's just a pretty tired gimmick it was a good idea when it started but. It was a good one-time idea. Yeah, it's a, it's an idea like you should do once every five years or something. <laughs> like, yeah, it's not the it's something you should do every year because it's it, you know, basically if you have the money in the bank briefcase and you're not an idiot, you'll win. Right, and we've seen it like we've seen it used in every conceivable way. You know, we've seen it used, you know, after the champion has won like a grueling match and the guy runs down and cashes in and has a cheap win. We've seen it, you know cash in a much more sportsmanlike way it's just it's it's sort of there's no way to surprise people with the money in the bank thing the ambrose thing was as close as they came yeah only because they, they normally milk it for months yeah and i think like um you know the the way seth rollins cashed in was actually pretty smart yes i like that too because he didn't cash in like after the match he cashed in during the match where after like uh they were both beaten up well yeah roman reigns was beaten up and that really emphasized Seth's character at the time, which is that he's like this, like weaselly shit heel who's going to just try to get an unfair advantage. Yeah, that was good stuff. I, uh, but like, you know, the problem with that is, is like, unless you're 
you know, unless you're not not clever with your cash in, you're probably going to win. Right. So it's the kind of thing where like it, it takes a lot of the uh, you know the excitement out of the money in the bank thing because you know like how many people have had the money in the bank briefcase cashed in and lost? It's like a real small it's, percentage. It's happened. It's happened, but, yeah. but like it's people like Jack Swagger or something that. Damien Sandow. Damien Sandow. See, that's like uh, <laughs> that's who you'd expect to to lose when they uh, cash in the briefcase. It also because it's essentially like a cheap shot. It's hard to do it in a way. If you're a good guy and you have the money in the bank briefcase, it's hard to do it in a way that's going to make the crowd sympathize with you. Shine actually did a really good job where Evilise comes in at the beginning of the match before it starts. And it's like, okay, here we are. And so then you can be like, yeah, she's getting an equal shot. But otherwise, it's kind of like, all right, so wait, you're, you know, the even if the champion's a villain, like you're coming in to cash in after the guy's had a match, like that's shitty. It doesn't make a lot. I mean, it's just, it's a, it should be used sparingly. And it, it's, they use it every year and sometimes they let it drag on for months and months and months. Yeah. I mean, it was awful when Seamus had it last time. Yeah, and I mean, part of that's because they they had nothing for him to do. Like, he's a guy who has like this, uh, you know, a, a guaranteed shot at a, a title match, and like he they just let him disappear. Yeah, I mean, he was just gone. He was he wasn't so much gone. It's just like they didn't do anything with him, so he was just no. like getting beat all the time. Yeah, he was irrelevant, and uh, that's not what they should do with that gimmick. But uh, yeah, so yeah, overall, it was it was okay. It wasn't uh, it wasn't the strongest pay per view they've had recently. But um, you know, Cena Styles was good. The main event was good. Yeah, I mean, there was a the rest of it was kind of well. I mean, there was the women's match that was bad. That was bad. Um, Rusev Titus O'Neil was bad. Yeah, that was uh, not so hot. It was just, I mean, I guess it. I, okay, the ending was good. The ending was good. The ending where he's like insulted his insulting kids. his kids. That's that's good stuff. I like that. But the match itself was a snooze. Yeah, it was just like two dudes punching on each other. And I, I one prediction I totally got wrong from last week is I said that uh, Apollo Cruz Sheamus was going to be a good match. It wasn't bad, but it was just nothing. Yeah, I did. I kind of expected that to be better than it was. And I guess shame on me for having some, uh, having, <laughs> you know, having, having a little bit of faith in Seamus and Apollo Crews. Cause both those guys are capable of so much more. It's just, the whole thing just felt like C plus. Well, I always feel, I, I don't feel that Seamus is capable of so much more. Like, does he have good matches ever? Like, yes, I, I honestly think Seamus is a, is like a, a huge sleeper talent. Like if he was used better, He's like a big hoss who's not afraid to throw himself around. It's just does he? Um, does, does, can you name any Sheamus matches that are awesome? I think I could if I went back and looked at some previous Sheamus matches. The last two years, since he came back from his injury, they have used him horribly. That is true. But prior to that, Sheamus had some really good matches. He's just like a big brute, and uh, he can really go. Um, but they just don't let him. They don't have him do anything interesting. Uh, I guess I'll take your word for it because I haven't seen him in anything like I don't know that I would consider like a really good match. Yeah, there he it's it's been it's been a long time. Um that's that's probably we didn't talk about the tag team thing. And uh ugh. my prediction for the tag team thing worked worked out, which was that uh I didn't predict the winner, I just predicted that one of the <laughs> one of the pod villains would be the person who was pinned. That's right. I was slightly surprised the New Day won, but I guess it makes sense to keep they're the most popular tag team right now. Enzo and Cass are over and getting more and more popular. Um I guess it makes sense to save a feud between those two instead of having it end in some kind of dumb four way. Yeah, but also I think uh, it makes sense to um, keep it on the New Day and give, um, like, the Bullet Club guys the the titles when you're more willing to give all the other titles to Bullet Club people. Yep. I mean, that's, like, basically the the New Japan formula for the Bullet Club is just, like, they have all the titles. So, like, if you're not willing to give AJ the title right now... (laughs) 
like don't bother with um the uh the other guys either like it would be it would be better if like whatever show they end up on um it could just be like aj is the is the title holder the other guys have the tag team titles and whatever the third title will be i um u.s title i assume those will be split between shows the u.s title and the uh intercontinental Intercontinental. title yeah that would make sense although just because it makes sense doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna do it yeah i mean they just might add extra titles for no reason bring back the hardcore title and the cruiserweight title (laughs) i'd like to see the cruiserweight title come back but uh bring back the european junior tag titles or whatever (laughs) i'm less excited about that maybe Junior tag time. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I think I, I think that was the right call on the tag teams. Was there anything else on uh, Monday night? It was pretty lackluster actually, except for those two matches. It was, yep. and the promo uh, where they had Kevin Owens uh, interacting with um, Chris Jericho and uh, Alberto Del Rio. That was pretty funny. That's true. But man. Yeah, it wasn't that great of a show all, overall, but there were some good, there were some high spots. There were some, uh, you know, bright areas in a sea of darkness. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, so uh, we like lists on the show, and What Culture just came out with a list of the 12 best songs about wrestling. What, what Culture makes terrible wrestling lists? I just want to point that out, like, they do. We've, we've talked about this before. But, did, uh, did they ever make good wrestling lists um, on What Culture? Because I've seen a bunch of their wrestling lists, and they have like a whole What Culture wrestling thing. Like they us. do. Yeah, they write regularly about it, and um, and I always, which is why I, I always wonder, like, who are the people who make these lists? Because they're, uh, like, uh, is it like, um, like a, you know, like people in their early twenties who like. Ha- yes. Uh, haven't uh, had any uh, experience with wrestling before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're right. So they they made a list of, and now in fairness, this is not a list of, because there's a whole genre of uh, songs by wrestlers. This is not that. That's a different story. This is songs about wrestling. And... Um, I don't know. It's pretty... So, I, you and I listen to a lot of music. We've heard a lot of... We like a lot of obscure music. A lot of these were um, were pretty surprising for me because I hadn't heard of many of them. And the ones I had heard of, I, I knew I didn't like it, with a couple of exceptions. So, I'll, we'll go right into the list, see what you think. We'll talk about some of our favorite songs about wrestling. Yeah. Jeez. So, their list going down. Uh, Killer Mike song, Ric Flair, which actually I like. That's a good one. Fine. Uh, P. Lander Z... Terry Punk. This is a Japanese band um, that I've never heard before, but I saw that their song Terry Punk come up a lot. People apparently, apparently it's pretty good. Maybe we should check it out. Um, Let's see this next one on the list. I know it's bad. NRBQ, uh, the Ultimate Bar Band. NRBQ apparently did a song about Captain Lou Albano called Captain Lou, and it's it's number three on this, or I guess number ten on this list. Um. Art Brute, the sort of post Brit pop British band song Unprofessional Wrestling, which actually is not really about wrestling, it's about sex. But that's on here. Uh the Mountain Goats Stab the Death Outside San Juan. So now this is an interesting choice because they took it from the Mountain Goats album Beat the Champ, which is entirely about wrestling. <laughs> the whole album is about wrestling. The whole album is about wrestling, and they somehow managed to pick the worst song. <laughs> Like you could have picked any other song on that album, and it would. I mean, "Stab to Death Outside San Juan" is about Bruiser Brody, the murder of Bruiser Brody, which is an interesting subject. But the song is just, it's a, it's a boring drone. It's like a terrible song, and there are so many better. Like the Ballad of Chavo Guerrero is a better song. Honestly, I think my favorite song on there is the song called "Choked Out," which is a song about being choked out in the wrestling ring. It's great. You could have picked any other song on that album, and I would have been like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But you picked the one. Sort of unlistenable, slow, boring song. Uh, next, Bruce Springsteen, The Wrestler. That was the theme song to the Mickey Rourke movie. Yeah. That featured yeah. Necro Butcher, among others. 
uh, eh, I like Springsteen all right, but this song is not one of his. Be- I don't know that he plays it in concert. Let's put it that way. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say he does not play it in concert. Um, next they have a song by a band called If I Had a Hi Fi, and the song is called Someone Take the Damn Money, which is apparently about um, Harley Race's famous feud with Ric Flair and the Flair for the Gold, which is a great topic for a song. I've never heard the song. But I did notice on what culture they said the band is frequently compared to not a surf, and I thought, oh, okay, all right. I don't, I don't know that I need to listen to this. <laughs> I think I could probably skip listening to that. Um, after that, they had Lime Cell, the famous, Amer- well, famous, the American Oi band, Lime Cell, and a song about Stan Hansen called The Lariat. Like, uh, I like some Oi. I like some street punk. But man, Lime Cell, it's just... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a Rough Riders posse cut, apparently called Pay Per View from the late '90s. It's got uh, Jada Kiss and Drag On and um, uh, somebody else who is in the Rough Riders, <laughs> not DMX. DMX is not on this. Haven't heard it. Um, another rap song, Action Bronson. He's a big fat white hipster rapper guy. He apparently has a song about Barry Horowitz that Barry Horowitz himself hates. So, uh, the next one, this one, I because re- I often think about the subject of songs about wrestling because that's the kind of life I live. And this song is always something that I have in the back of my mind as an example of a bad song about wrestling. <laughs> and for them, it's their number two uh, best song about wrestling. It's The Crusher by The Ramones. This is on The Ramones' final studio album, Adios Amigos. It's sung by that like young like 25 year old bass player they drafted in at the end it's it was written by dd at the end of his life toward the end of his life it just sucks it's a bad it's a dumb dumb song that album sucks there's like there's maybe one good song on there and it's written by tom waits uh it's just it's a song like about of it's not the you may be thinking of a song that the cramps did uh, about the Crusher, uh, Crusher Lazowski, the famous AWA wrestler. This is not that song. This is a different song written by Dee Dee Ramone about a fictional wrestler. It's really bad. Oh, yeah. And then the number one song about wrestling, according to what culture, is uh, Wrestlers by Hot Chip, which I've never heard. They're like an elect- I guess they're like an electronic pop group or something, elect- EDM. I don't know what they are. I'm out of my league here. <laughs> I don't know either. I've never heard of them. But this is a pretty disappointing list. It's a garbage list, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say you don't have to you don't have to pull punches here. It's a garbage list. Um, There's... I, I don't I don't know how to. Uh, I I think if I were to make a top ten list of songs about wrestling, not a single one of these would be on there. Uh, maybe the Killer Mike song. Yeah, m- Ric Flair. Maybe. Um, but yeah, well, I guess like, you know, if you, if you just Google searched songs about wrestling and then kind of randomly put them in order, this could be that list. (laughs) So some of my favorites that did not make this list, uh, first of all, if we're talking about songs about Bruiser Brody, um, the Kansas punk rock group Cocknoose, you're not familiar with Cocknoose folks. Let me tell you about Cocknoose. They sound like anti-scene. Uh, <laughs> You're not helping with these descriptions, Tom, because like <laughs> you don't know cock news. Well, they're just like anti-scene, and you're just like everybody is like I don't know what that is either. They're uh, they're very they're so kind of imagine. Remember, like in the '80s when uh, like on, on cop TV shows or cop movies, they'd go into like a punk club and there'd be this like really loud, awful band on stage. That's cock news, basically. But they have a song called "Invader Number One Must Die." Invader number one, of course, was the guy who stabbed and killed Bruiser Brody. It's great. Uh, it's a like a thrashy. It sounds. I mean, it's a, it's it's. If you think of like punk rock as just like a god awful racket, this song will confirm that. I love it, and uh, it's um it's a pointed message to Invader number one, who still in fact is alive and well and and uh, in politics in Puerto Rico. Um. But some other ones that uh. I feel like uh, we're uh, unfairly left off. Maybe a little more obscure. Although this is a pretty obscure list. But um, Michael Baldwin, who was a folk singer in the 70s, 
wrote a song called uh, The Wrestling Queen for the movie about uh, Vivian Vachon, the woman uh, wrestler who was uh, related to um, Luna uh, Mad Dog Vachon, Butcher Vachon. Exactly. And it's really good. It's weird. I mean, it's a 70s like folk pop song. But it's actually really well done. I think because like the guy was just commissioned to do it and like didn't really care. And so he wrote the song about what it's like to be a woman wrestler. Um, but uh, it's um, I enjoy it. Uh, one I was looking because I was looking. I was like, OK, who, what other songs are, are there uh, out there? Um, there's apparently a, a band in Japan called Pink Cloud. I don't know. Which has covered uh, Hulk Hogan's song Itch Band. Oh yeah, the Itch Band. Uh, Colt Cabana recommends that song highly. Um, uh, oh, and the speaking of uh, punk bands, uh, there's a punk band from Cleveland called the Lords, and they have a song called "The Killer," which is about Killer Tim Brooks, the old uh, NWA wrestler. Um, and uh, did I mention Anti Scene? Anti scene. The anti scene have a have a pro wrestling song. They have a song about Cactus Jack. Oh, okay. Um, and the final one, I actually haven't heard the song, but I saw uh, Colt Cabana talking about it. Uh, there's a guy, I guess, a folk singer or folk pop singer named David Robert Bridge, who has a song called uh, Mitsuharu Misawa. All right. Um. But in general, like. The what culture thing just seems so random. Like I, I don't know why you would pick some of these songs. The remote, I, I think it's just because part of it, I think, is name recognition. Instead of saying like, "Oh, we're gonna have like some obscure Canadian folk singer," it's like, "Well, we should get a Ramones and Bruce Springsteen and Rough Riders and <laughs> I guess NRBQ." I wonder if NR is NRBQ popular at all. No, but they're sort of well-known-ish. I mean, compared to the, you know, compa- compared to Cock News, they're pretty well-known. Well, I guess, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, but, like, you're not going to hear NRBQ songs on the radio, are you? No, that's probably true. I mean, no. <laughs> I, I can't think of ever having that happen to me, being inflicted with that. <laughs> they're pretty boring. They're like, they have Connecticut roots folks which explains our antipathy toward them because if when we grew up uh there were a million like shitty bar bands in uh in our home state that all wanted to sound like nrbq and uh, nrbq was still playing bars at that point yeah they i mean in, including a show in our hometown at uh the a famous local landmark the hungry tiger everyone's gonna know also, everyone's gonna be able to find our hometown now Tom. also known as the gritty kitty um but yeah, well yeah, so you can find our hometown and you can maybe come here and see NRBQ. Uh, NRBQ is too big for the Tiger Town. That's right. Maybe Cocknews. I don't. Know. I actually don't think Cocknews is still together. They should be. More, they should be more uh, so than they NRBQ be, at least. <laughs> they should be dragged out of retirement uh, and offered uh, a lucrative uh, contract to play Coachella. Um. But yeah, so. Uh, I don't know. Songs about wrestling. There are a lot of good ones out there. They're, they tend to be more obscure and you kind of have to hunt around. But uh, don't take what culture's word for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll post some of these on the blog. I, actually, I've been avoiding the blog the last couple days because I got a, me- I got a message uh, that freaked me out from an anonymous person claiming to be the daughter of... Uh, Ann and Ray Gunkel, who were NWA promoters in Georgia in the 70s. So I, I wrote, some months back, I wrote an account of uh, based on stuff I'd read uh, about how the territory war in Georgia in the 70s, how like Ann Gunkel basically got, after Ray died, um, Ann Gunkel basically got screwed out of running the NWA office in Atlanta because the sort of good old boys network didn't like her. And then on um, Sunday, right before the pay-per-view, actually, I got a message from an anonymous. The person identified themselves as the daughter of uh, Ann and Ray Gunkel and just said, who are you? (laughs) And uh, in my old reporter days, I would have taken this as an opportunity to, like, make contact and maybe learn something. But I'm uh, I'm very much a no-drama llama these days. 
and I saw that, I was just like, oh, God, I don't want anything to do with it. If there's someone who's like, the article is very favorable to Ray and Anne, I should say. Like, it, it was definitely written from the from their perspective and about how they got, or uh, I mean, how Anne got screwed over because, I mean, Ray was dead. But uh, I just didn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been, like, avoiding the blog. I think I'm going to disable anonymous commenting, too. You should have, uh, you should have said, you should have said you're Tom Breen. I'm Tom Breen. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. And it, I don't know if it was hostile. I don't know if it was, like, a hostile, who the hell are you, or it was, like, a curious, like, who are you and why are you writing this lengthy essay about my parents? I don't. I didn't. I couldn't tell. I just didn't even respond. I just like. Oop. So yeah, I've been avoiding the blog, but uh, I mean, I, I'm gonna go back to it, obviously, and I'll post. Uh, I will post Invader Number One Must Die. Do it. Um. So that was my exciting news for the week, that I had a weird encounter, possibly with. Ray Gunkel's daughter. All right. Maybe uh, maybe she's searching for lawsuit material and she needs your help, Tom. Right. That's all I could think about. That's how this is how like weird I am. Like all I, I uh, these days I just think people want to sue. It's like I don't want anything to do with lawsuits. I don't. You can't libel the dead. I'm not really worried about Ray or Ann Gunkel's you know estate because you you can say whatever you want about dead people and they can't. They can't sue you. It's one of the great things about being dead. Um, or I should say being alive. Uh, but uh, so um, what do we have coming up uh, this week? Do you have any uh, any plans to go to any wrestling shows? Any exciting pay-per-views you're looking forward to? Are there any exciting pay-per-views coming up, Tom? No. I, I didn't. Not that I know of. I didn't think so. But um, I might have something coming up. Um, let me, let me check. Somebody invited me to something, but I haven't, uh, I haven't looked at what it is. So, um, maybe I'll, I'll check that out. Let's see. What is it though? Oh, it's the, uh, the next New Japan show, Kizuna Road. It's Okay. Um, I may go to that. It's next month, but I'm. It's it's a little. It's I guess it's like not terribly expensive, but you know, it's you know, it's like sixty bucks. That's a little on the pricey side. That's on the pricey side, but uh, it is the it is the pay per view, I guess. So maybe it's the pay per view. I don't know. It would be pretty cool to go to a New Japan pay-per-view. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's the pay-per-view. It might be a minor one. I guess it is, actually, now that I think about it. Um, yeah, I guess, like, Kizuna Road is after Dominion, so... <sighs> Who knows? Who knows, but... uh. That it would be worth going to. They put in a good show. You can see a lot of six man and eight man tags. Well, I mean, it, I guess maybe we'll see more Okada versus Naito since Naito lost the championship. Oh, I know. I was actually kind of bummed out about that. Yeah, you know, I don't. I mean, I guess like those two guys are like probably my two favorite guys in New Japan. So like, I don't really care. But like. I would prefer Naito as the champion, but I, I my guess is that what they're doing is they're just setting up their their next Wrestle Kingdom main event as Naito versus Okada. Yeah, I think that's probably right. I would have liked to have seen them keep the belt on Naito for a little longer, though. Yeah, it would have been better, but you know, <laughs> I mean, at the last uh, New Japan pay per view, uh, basically, uh, lo. Los Ingobernables got destroyed. Like they, they, all the members lost their matches. Yeah. But uh, I guess it doesn't really matter. It'll be no. It'll be. It'll still be fine. Michael Elgin is a champion now. Michael El, Big Mike. He. Uh, hey, and uh, G One's coming up in July, right? Yeah, the G One should be good. 
who knows? G one's always pretty interesting. It goes on forever, though. Yeah, there's like a there's like a G one show every day for like thirty days. It's just never ending G one shows. It's a it's a lot. It's a lot to commit to. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not sure how many G one show G one uh, shows there are, but I, I think like there's maybe everybody has eight matchups or something or ten. I don't even know. It's a lot because like, you know, there's like a, the point standing thing where everyone gets points for depending on if they win or lose. It's, it's, it's convoluted. It is confusing. I just hope we see another breakout performance like we did with big Mike last year. Somebody else shows up and uh, you suddenly are like, I can't believe I didn't like this guy before. Exactly. Dolph Ziggler. Dolph Ziggler. Del Ziggler is someone I can see showing up in G1 and like surprising everybody. Not actually, but like if he were to show up, I mean. I agree. 100%. Um, that would be a good thing for Cody Rhodes too, although he's not he's got too much other stuff going on. Oh uh, yeah. And I, I don't think he could be in G1 because it's too soon. Yeah, he's he's uh he's not cleared until um August 19th, which I think is like five days after G1 finally ends. Yeah, so next year for Cody Rhodes. Next year, I mean, he's going to be in Bola this year, so. Uh, and he's also going to be all over the place. One of the things, I, I, I've already bought tickets to this because I can't believe it. August 28th, he's going to be at the Northeast Arena, which is a rural town hall here in Connecticut. It's the town hall of the town of Bethany. And he's going to be he's going to be there along with Jushin Thunder Liger. That's weird. It's totally insane through Northeast Wrestling. The day before they're going to be in um, uh, at a minor league baseball park in Texas or in Texas in New York. And I'll probably go to that show too because uh, Cody Rhodes is scheduled to wrestle Kurt Angle at the minor league ballpark, and um, Liger is going to wrestle Jeff Hardy. And then I guess Liger and Cody Rhodes are going to wrestle in like a gym in front of 180 people. It's going to be nuts. I can't believe how I'm so excited for it. That's that's um, it's a good show to see in a in a town hall. It is. I can't believe it. Um, so there's some good shows coming up. I'm actually uh, Saturday. I'm going to see. Um, Blitzkrieg Pro here in Enfield. We've got uh, it's a pretty decent card. A lot of local guys who are good, but uh, Ethan Carter the third is going to be there. EC3, Matt Riddle and Flex Rumble Crunch have a match that should be good. Um, your man Swoggle is going to be there. Oh Swoggle. Oh Swoggle, really? Um, I don't know what Swoggle's going to do. I don't. I don't think he's wrestling, but uh, he'll be there. Um, so yeah, a lot of potential for uh, fun shows coming up this summer. I'm uh, <clears throat> doing kind of a staycation thing because I'm I'm not broke, but I spent a lot of money on plumbing improvements in my house. Yeah. So uh, we can tell you're not broke because you're a homeowner. That's right. That's right. So while I'm not broke, I don't have a lot of money to throw around. So instead of traveling, <coughs> I'm just going to go to a bunch of wrestling shows. That's that's fine. Yeah, exactly. At least I'm not spending the money on drugs, you know? Like some other people, like Roman Reigns. <laughs> and that brings us full circle. <laughs> um, folks, thanks for listening. If you uh, get the urge for more of this hot hashtag content you can uh head on over to twitter the old twitter.com where uh i often live tweet major wrestling events uh i am at tj breen if you are uh, related to the gunkles please don't follow me on twitter and then try to sue me i I don't want to be sued uh you can follow joe at uh uh x corn muffin x and um you can follow us on the old Tumblr, 
where I'll have a little more content once I, the heebie-jeebies have resided, receded. Uh, I'm uh, at closetofanxiety.tumblr.com. Joe is hockagenjoe.tumblr.com. I have a bunch of wrestling magazines that I have to scan, and uh, so there'll be a lot of old, good old content coming up soon. Yeah, I have a lot of wrestling magazines to scan, too. I actually uh, just haven't. Yeah, it's just one of those things that uh, I mean, I mean to do all the time, but when I actually have the time, I, I find myself doing something else. I just have to I just have to sit down and make the time for it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the same with me. But I have like a lot of I have a lot of stuff that I should sit down and do that I just haven't. So it's uh, you know, makes things it makes things more difficult when you have the time because you you sit down and you think like, well, I should do all this other stuff. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, don't don't imagine at least in my case that um, I'm not uh scanning wrestling magazines because I'm doing something like really productive. It's usually just because like I want to watch an old horror movie or something. And then I forget. That's worthwhile too, though. Right. Yeah. At least I'm not doing drugs, unlike someone. Unlike we could name some other person who's recently suspended from his job for a month because he uh, couldn't couldn't pass a wellness policy test. Someone. Someone. Not not naming any names. But this person's name might rhyme with Broman brains. Yeah. They should have another character called Broman Brains. <laughs> they really should. Uh, um, all right. Uh, thanks. Uh, check back with us next week. Uh, hopefully uh, we'll have less injury and police news. And we'll have um, some more hot content about uh, the brand split. Yeah, that that actually should be happening when we're recording. Not next, not next week, though. Whenever. No, not next week. But maybe we'll get, you know... We'll have some. Uh, we'll have some. In, you know, actually, news almost never breaks on our cycle, so God knows what we'll have. What? Okay. What time? What time does uh, do we normally record there? What time is it? Eight eight p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Oh, so that's which is, that's the uh, that's when the show will actually start. Right. So. Uh, we'll we'll be responding. Yeah, we'll we'll be able uh, to respond in real time. That's right. Talk about being on our cycle. Yeah, it it we're, we're going to be breaking news like right away. It's going to be uh it'll be good except that, you know, like I have to render the video and stuff and that takes a while, which means that it's not really like you guys will have heard all this stuff already. <laughs> but you won't hear our hot takes on it. That's what you that's what you tune in for. Yeah. These sizzling takes well, all all throughout the podcast. Uh, Tom Tom will be stopping to tell us who uh who has been uh drafted. That's right. I'll be monitoring it, and I'll say, "Oh my God, I can't believe they brought back um, the gobbledygooker, <laughs> Hector Guerrero." Hector Guerrero. They <laughs> can't believe Crime Time is back. Yeah, <laughs> Crime Time. Oh my God. Oh. Uh, my, I guess if Crime Time comes back, they'll come back as somebody with a different name. One would hope that they don't come back with that ridiculous racist gimmick from the past. You'd, you'd think so. You'd hope. Um, if they do, I assume their their next WWE run, like their initial run, will be very short. Yeah. Yeah, I think you might be right. I'd rather see people come in from the indies than some guys who've already had a run. You know, unless it's somebody like uh, John Morrison who's really sort of grown outside WWE and has really, like, shown us he can do a lot more than he did when he was with the company. They'll, they'll bring in uh, Angelico and Son of Havoc. That would be amazing. At least one of those but, guys used to be in WWE. It's true. Um, yeah. I don't know. A lot of people I'd like to see them bring in, like, have uh, deals with ROH and uh, Lucha Underground, so probably will not be coming in. Will you think uh, that show will be the reveal of Moose? Oh, yeah. Moose. Yeah, that could be. I 
I don't know what they're going to do for him, though, because, like, without the Moose entrance theme, it's not going to be, uh, it's not going to be half as fun to see him. No, I agree. He's one of those guys like the Sandman or Gorgeous George, where half the fun is in the entrance. Yeah, that's, that's true. All right, well, anyway, if you can think of any wrestling songs you like or anyone you'd like to see return to WWE, feel free to leave us a comment or tweet at us or send us uh, a comment through Tumblr, but not if you're angry that I talked about your parents who are wrestling promoters. That's that's probably a good policy to go by. Feels like that should go without saying. Yeah. G- generally, gener- as a general rule, don't uh, don't tweet at people. If you're uh, want to sue them for talking about your parents who are res- for formerly wrestling promoters, that's right. That's right. All right, everyone. Thanks. See, I guess we'll see you guys next time, right? You're coming back next time. Come back next time. Damn right. See ya. <laughs>